friends for a while, and she is the director of the UCF Center for Autism and Related Disorder, CARD. Uh, she is going to talk today about uh, improving post-secondary post outcomes for um, students with disabilities who are also Latino. So I'm going to turn it over to Terry. One shameless plug for uh, DCDT is at 930, we have uh, a membership meeting where you can learn more about membership. And then our actual membership meeting, annual meeting, is going to be June 1st. I'll put it in the chat box. It'll be virtual, but it's June 1st at 3.30. So we will put that in the chat box, just a reminder. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, Canon. And um, good morning. I'm really happy to be here to present on this today. And even though it says it's for Hispanic and Latino students with ASD, I'm hopeful that you'll see that these recommendations also apply to a lot of other students with ASD. This is part of a grant funded by the Florida Developmental Disabilities Council to address a disparity in how many students who are Hispanic and Latino with ASD enter post-secondary. And we conducted a bunch of research over the past three years. I'm not going to go into the details of the methods, but I've included some of the slides in the handouts for you to look at a little bit longer including the survey we did at the Visions Conference in 2019. So I'm gonna skip right to the heart of the matter and hopefully tell you about what we found, what we hope you can do, and some resources that we've created. So beginning with some facts, the uh, Florida Hispanic Latino ASD population is growing um, in the high school level. It's gone from 29% to 33% of all ASD students over the last five years. And increasingly, the students are graduating and moving on to post-secondary education. And so last uh, Florida data book indicated over 3,600 students identified as ASD entered the Florida system. So about 400 more students each year for the last five years. And that's probably an underestimate, which we'll see in a little while why that might be. And so what do we know about these students? So we know that like other Hispanic students, these students tend to choose um, two-year public colleges and they tend to uh, attend part-time and live at home with their family and have a lot of family involvement. And like other Hispanic Latino students, they tend to not take loans out to finance their education. So they're going off what money they have on hand. And also like other ASD students, but unlike other Hispanic students, they don't drive. And frequently they are not um, learning Spanish as their first language. English is their first language primarily. And so um, we also know that students with ASD frequently fail to access resources that are available to them for success in post-secondary ed. So about 31% of students with ASD said they could really cope with stress and anxiety well, 42% indicated that they felt depressed, and fewer than half of all students with ASD actually even disclosed their disability to their institution. So that's actually the worst out of all the disability groups in um, higher education. And a lot of these only disclose as a last resort and uh, show some really lacking self-advocacy skills and self-determination skills. And so all of those factors can lead to challenges in actually completing post-secondary ed. So well, how do we explain this and what, what do we do and how do we change this? So the very first thing is understanding the intersection of Hispanic and Latino culture and ASD. Most families of students who are Hispanic Latino with ASD, they acknowledge autism is a lifelong condition, but their faith in God gives them this hope that the child's gonna have a very productive future. They're more likely to rely on, on prayer and divine intervention to address challenges of ASD than other cultures are. They also tend to resist putting labels on the child and that can result in either delays in getting specialized supports or sometimes not even telling the child about their diagnosis. And they also are more tolerant of individual differences or a little bit lackadaisical about some of the problem areas we see in autism, particularly those that they see it's just part of my child. And so there's uh, that, and then some taboos about discussing mental health issues in Hispanic families. So those kinds of challenges may not be shared outside the family, and that can result in problems like anxiety and depression going untreated. 
Hispanic families have familismo, which is a cultural value that uh, is also a source of social capital for students with ASD. And this involves having a really strong identification within the media and extended family and the kind of like the collective, the needs of the group are over the needs of the individual. And so there's this interdependency within the family unit. And we also see that Hispanic and uh, Hispanic Latino families place fewer demands on their children regarding behavioral expectations and independence and daily living skills. And we saw that in our research, the parents were providing really high levels of support. They said their child's time was to be devoted to homework and they were not required to complete chores. They also provide a lot of assistance with organization and staying on top of assignments when they're given. And so those values of familismo run counter to the outcomes that we value as mainstream educational people, right? We want them to have self-determination, independence, autonomy. And we kind of look down our nose at helicopter parents, but this is an area where we might need to capitalize on a cultural difference that can better support post-secondary enrollment for our Hispanic and Latino students. There's also the role of the mujeres, the mothers and the women in the family unit. Um, these are the anchors for childcare and for raising the children. And in turn, it, it gives this big loyalty that the children give back to the mothers. So Hispanic moms of children with ASD are fiercely protective and very strong advocates for their children. Many reported that those advocacy skills were a real source of pride, but at the same time, those advocacy skills can prevent the students from themselves taking on that role of uh, self-advocacy. So um, the last thing that we need to talk about is just this idea of confianza, which is that trust that Hispanic families put in professionals to give them what they need. So it's kind of a Latin American form of reciprocity. And so in, cult in culture, they basically say, um, you know, if you know something, if you have something, you're going to give it to me. I don't have to ask you for it. You're just going to do it out of that confianza. So those are some of the things that can be challenges um, to post-secondary success. They kind of fly in the face of the things that we value and some, some of what research shows is helpful. And in our research with families, we basically identified a cascade of barriers to post-secondary enrollment and completion that starts in middle school and the secondary grades. And basically there's a lot of information that doesn't quite make it to these families. And because they have that expectation of of confianza, the professionals are supposed to give them that information, that can create a barrier because they don't have it. And when information is provided, it's not in Spanish, which is still the dominant language for most of the parents of these students. And we also found that parents and the students themselves reported there was no direct instruction in a variety of skills that research has linked to post-secondary success. So social skills, executive functioning, perceptive, perception, perspective taking and advocacy. Um, the students said they rarely participated in their IEP meetings in a meaningful way. A lot of them felt they were so focused on academics, they didn't have time for anything else. And so although most of the parents wanted their children to go on to post-secondary education, they felt like they were on their own floundering trying to find information. So what can we do as educators to improve that situation? So we have 10 recommendations. The first one is we need to make sure that people understand the importance of appropriate ASD eligibility. Okay, so a lot of times we have students floating around in OHI, intellectual disabilities, other kinds of classrooms and other kinds of placements. And that can really not give people the right idea about what kinds of skills need to be targeted for transition success. So the CDC says that the prevalence rate of ASD within the high school should be about 1.9%. And in the 2019-2020 FTE count, our high school populations were only at 1.3%. So there's some under-identification going on, and that can be a barrier to students receiving the appropriate supports and services they need to transition. So eligibility under ASD should help drive offering co coursework and transition planning to address some of the core deficits. And so I'm gonna go over briefly the core deficits. Most of you are already familiar with autism spectrum disorders and the three main deficits. 
These kinds of challenges, we can exacerbate them by over accommodating the students or sheltering them from the natural consequences they're going to experience after they get out of high school. And then there are a lot of times where people aren't sure of what curriculum to push or whether they should push the academics or other skills. So if, uh, if the students are primarily in general education classrooms, they're not getting any instruction on the kinds of skills or very little instruction on the kind of skills that they're going to need to really become a self-advocate, become self-determined and, and show those things. And so there are these secondary aspects of ASD that actually cause the most problems for students in post-secondary that need to be addressed in high school. And I don't have time to do a detailed walkthrough of all of these, um, these challenges, but you can kind of see them here and they're in the, the handouts notes. And if you want any more training on that, I know that CARD will be happy to provide that. But I wanna focus in on executive functioning because executive functioning has been determined to be the biggest reason why students with ASD drop out or, or experience difficulty in post-secondary education. And these kinds of problems in planning and organization and flexibility really impact them in the way that they are able to participate in post-secondary education. So if we don't identify and address these kinds of concerns through instruction in high school, we are not gonna be preparing the students for success in post-secondary education. And it's a lot of times the students say, oh yes, yes, that was mentioned. Everybody said I had a problem with that in my IEP meeting, but I was just, it's in my IEP, but I was just expected to be able to develop those things and nobody really taught them to me. So we really need to focus on educating students in those strategies to overcome those core deficits. And our second recommendation is to use the social capital of familismo to promote access to post-secondary. So, activating these mamas to really know what they need to do, where they need to go. They're willing to do it. If you tell them the path to post-secondary, they'll create that expectation within the family and within the child. And we might need to talk to them about ASD as a learning style difference rather than a disability to kind of shake off that idea that it might be stigmatizing and really talk to them about the benefits of disclosure and explaining aspects of ASD to their child, to their son or to their daughter. Um, and maybe take a little look back at ourselves and our own cultural biases and honor the social capital that Familismo provides to these students so that they can pursue their education without worrying about some of the other aspects of becoming a, an adult. So one of the things that they have identified to us that was helpful is having this very visual person-centered planning approach to identifying assets within the family that can help along that path to post-secondary education. And I imagine a lot of you are familiar with PATH. I know Finn and CARD and others have provided trainings on that as a person-centered planning. Um, our research also indicated that a lot of parents were misinformed about the requirements to enter post-secondary education. So 23% of families believe the child still needed to pass a test to enter a college program. A lot were, well, 20, 23, 25% were also under the misimpression that you needed, uh, that a student with access points diploma could not enter the Florida college system. So they weren't aware that our Florida state colleges are open admission to any students with a high school diploma or GED. So educating them on these things are, uh, are some of the goals that we can that put in front of ourselves. And we also asked the parents where they get their information from they got it from a lot of places, but over 50% of them said the school didn't give them anything. So again, because of confianza, we, we have this sense of frustration that they could have shared something, but it wasn't shared. So if we push that information out to these families in ways that are accessible to them, that should improve. Um, we asked parents about resources that came to them directly in Spanish. About 63% said they never got anything about transition in Spanish. And while there are not a lot of Spanish language resources to support transition, there are excellent resources. And I know, I, you know we've talked about Project 10's wonderful uh, materials that they have translated into Spanish. And I definitely recognize that that is a, a huge asset to our families. 
We need to give them information on financial literacy because they are um, not aware of many of the things that need to happen in order to pursue financial aid. Um, because they don't take loans, they may see that their child's post-secondary education is too expensive. They may not know about other resources for scholarships. Only about 8% of all parents said that they had understood about the FAFSA from what they learned at the child's school. And um, the parents were aware of Bright Futures, but a lot of them thought, well, that doesn't apply to my child. He's in ESE classes. Um, and since the, the families have one of the lowest income levels overall of all ethnic groups in Florida, it's really important that they understand that there are resources available out there. There's the Gold Seal Scholarship, which we could tell them about. Um, there's the idea of if there are um, opportunities to put in money into an ABLE Trust or a 529 plan. Um, there are scholarships directly for students with ASD. There are scholarships for Hispanic and Latino students, but a lot of the families don't know where to look. So as educators, as transition specialists, as helpful people, we want to give them that information because that's what they're customarily uh, expecting from us. We also found that they were not aware of the possibility that career and technical education dual enrollment could cut down the cost of college for them. And so um, they were not accessing that. Well, they were not finding out about it at all, actually. But um, they were basically unaware of vocational rehabilitation might be able to provide some funding for post-secondary education. So bringing all this kind of financial information into focus for them um, and explaining it to them in language that they can understand is really important. Um, we also know that there's a tendency to, uh, to recommend that students take a full load right at the beginning of college. And we found that our students with ASD from Hispanic and Latino backgrounds felt they did not do well taking a full load. And um, a lot of times they thought they had to because of their financial aid, either from vocational rehabilitation or from a Pell Grant or something like that. So they need to understand what full-time college means. It doesn't necessarily mean you take four courses, but at the same time, if you don't take classes fast enough, a lot of times you run out of financial aid before you actually finish. So those are some of the little facts that we need to kind of share with families in a very concrete way. Um, we also asked about how do they get information about college programs and whether they go to guidance offices or a career center, or college center on campus. And 78% of the parents were like, we don't know if that exists. None of the students in our focus groups um, or in our adult survey said they had ever seen such a place on their high school campus. But instead, they talked about the career and uh, college nights at the high school. And that was the primary way to learn about their post-secondary options. The problem, as you can probably see here, if you were a person with autism or even if you weren't, that kind of an environment is extremely overwhelming for our people. And not just for the students who find it a sensory nightmare, but also because the parents are there and their second language is the primary language that they're being spoken to in these events. So between trying to communicate in a, a, a situation where your you know, English is your second language, trying to ask questions and get answers in that kind of format is very difficult. So if those parents are not effective, we need to think about other ways we could engage families and students in this kind of discovery. And we are talking also with the post-secondary institutions about this. So thinking about alternative formats like web chats or virtual college fairs, um, videos that feature Spanish subtitles, those types of things may be things that you could work on with your liaisons with the state colleges and technical schools. Um, it was pretty clear also that they, they needed information on how ADA and IDA were different, how accommodations at high school that students were receiving are just not going to be the same as they are going to get in a post-secondary education program so that they have realistic expectations of what's going to happen once they get into that post-secondary education setting. Because if they're going to be depending on those kinds of accommodations, that could be a barrier to actually being successful. So that needs to be part of our family education as well. 
they were not aware that Florida has some specialized programs already in place for students with ASD um, at the post-secondary level. And so these six programs, five of which are at public uh, institutions and one at a private Hispanic serving institution have developed ASD specific kind of holistic support programs. Um, they're listed on their websites. Most of them are affiliated with their student accessibility center, but they're really specialized around the needs of students with ASD. And they're starting to attract a lot of interest from our families. So we really recommend that y'all become familiar with these programs and share information about them with your families, especially if you're near one of them, because we do know that most times our Hispanic and Latino students with ASD are going to attend a post-secondary um, program within two hours of their home and likely as not be commuting to it. Um, so uh, we also, of course, have the Center for Students with Unique Abilities. 30% of our students with ASD may also have intellectual disabilities. So that's another path that they can consider. The parents had heard vaguely that such programs existed, but they hadn't received any specific information about the programs or how they were funded or even where to go to get more information. So if you can share information about the website, even though it's all in English, there's, um, there's information in there on transition programs, the comprehensive transition programs, and then also the, the funding, the state scholarships that can be received by students who are entering those programs. And then beyond that, um, Brad Cox up at FSU has developed the um, College Autism Network, which has all sorts of information across the United States about post-secondary institutions offering ASD programs. And then, of course, you all know about Think College as well. And I apologize that I'm going really fast, but I'm trying to get through this before my time is up. Um, so our third recommendation is that high schools identify a culturally competent bilingual Hispanic point of contact within the school to act as an ambassador for these families. Parents don't want to go digging for the information and if it can be pushed out to them from ninth grade on or even earlier if possible, they're going to be in a lot better position to support post-secondary transition. So um, we also think using push technology electronically, pop-ups on websites, cell phone pushes and things like that to get that information out about early planning and specialized program and financial aid seminars would be really helpful. Um, our fourth recommendation is really simple. We have to start everything earlier. And I think that message is getting out there, but these quotes from two of the parents in our focus groups illustrate the concern with getting the information when it's too late. So starting earlier, um, the information that we need to share with students includes the R and the pre-ETS program as soon as they are able to take advantage of that at 14 the issues of the problems associated with ASD that need to be addressed in high school, um, and then what resources and are, are there both in the high school and in the community to help address those things. And so um, parents who are within the Hispanic Latino culture, they really like to share with each other. So sometimes it might be possible to identify some mentor parents who are either parents of graduates, parents of current students, or actual alumni from the high school who be willing to help with this kind of an endeavor as well. Because I realize not every high school has a wide abundance of culturally competent Hispanic, uh, Spanish speaking uh, individuals to, to uh, help with this role. And there are a lot of um, exploration tools out there. Mi Proximo Paso is the Spanish equivalent of My Next Move from ONET. It's an excellent resource. I'm gonna just skip ahead because um, you can look at those in the handouts. Um, another issue we found was that most of our Hispanic and Latino students with ASD chose only one of two of the seven diploma pathways, either this 24 credit standard option or access points. And so um, we have a concern that maybe too many students are on access point check, uh, which brings us to our fifth recommendation, which is expand the pathways that are selected by Hispanic and Latino students with ASD. Um, we need to talk about these things. We need to talk about CTE and we need to talk about things like the um, uh, graduation with employment and academics. And, 
and the 18 credit Excel and all of these things that nobody really explains to the, the families. And so um, thinking about that and thinking about how students have till 22 to graduate, um, taking into account CTE and other coursework and either spreading out or adding another year, deferring graduation um, to be able to pursue more of this kind of work on the core deficit areas, the career exploration and the organization structure and so on that will help them to be um, more successful in post-secondary. So um, uh, there are a couple reasons why spreading things out over more than four years could be beneficial. Number one, they will be able to better take part in extracurricular activities because they won't be focused so much on studying for those core 24 credit academic courses. They can take more electives, they can take more CTE and, and, and seek more information on what is the career that they're interested in really about. And then also they might be able to spend some time taking ESE coded courses that are not on our 24 credit um, credit earning system, but are definitely needed. And they don't get to take advantage of those courses if they are just solely focused on getting their 24 credits in four years. Um, so you all know about the different diploma paths. So we have the ones that are available to everybody. Um, and then we also have those that are available to only students with, okay, now why is it not advancing? Now it advanced too much. Um, only to students who are uh, on an IEP, go back, go back. Okay, I'm not exactly sure I'm stuck somehow here. Okay, so these are the options that are available to students with an IEP. We need to inform families of all of these different options early on so they can make decisions that make sense for their son or daughter. We need to tell them more about career and technical education. A lot of times um, the parents shared that they had never heard of career and technical education. And we need to get that information out there. And now that we have the middle school requirement, I think that will, will help a little bit. But what we found in our research was that none of the students said they were being prepared um, until 11th or 12th grade. That's when they started hearing about these kinds of options. But by that time, they kind of felt like, no, they didn't have enough time to really pursue them. So they were not gonna take advantage. So um, deferment is another thing that we think should be discussed early on. It is not a horrible thing to take a five-year program. People do it in college. They get more than just a college degree by taking a five-year program. Same thing in high school you can defer and pursue one of the five options that are allowed after deferring um, if there's additional need for ESE support in order to um, make those gains and to, to complete those programs. And so um, sharing that information, and again, the um, family guide for uh, secondary transition from Florida um, Project 10 is a great resource for that. Um, we want to promote options to explore careers because a lot of times uh, students with ASD have a romanticized idea of what a career is going to be like. They may envision it as being something that's a solitary pursuit they can do on their own. So the more CTE courses they take, the better prepared they will be to actually be successful in that field. And they'll also have the ability to really articulate to a program that can cut down on their costs of college because the high school will pay for the credits that articulate into the college or technical college. And so um, starting out with that view in mind as possibility is a good idea. Um, we also talked about IEP meetings. Parents shared that there wasn't a lot of information shared with them in IEP meetings about any of the things we've talked about. Um, you can see there that the highest percentage of endorsed answers said that none of the things there were actually discussed with them. And when we talked with the students about transition IEPs, they basically gave themselves like a D rating on a scale of one to five on how actively they participated in their IEP meeting um, or whether they even attended it at all. And they said they really didn't enjoy their meetings and they felt like their dreams were not linked to IEP outcomes. And so we need to change that. So we need to make sure that our IEPs, the transition focus is the main focus. 
And since we know that self-advocacy skills are linked to post-secondary success, but we also know that the Hispanic Latino culture kind of works against that, we need to share that research with the families, the, the link between self-advocacy and post-secondary success and get the students working on participating and talking for themselves and making their own decisions is really important. They also really need to understand their accommodations and how ASD affects them and to be able to articulate that um, and to go in and make some, make some progress in individual problem solving and, and executive functioning types of skills. So we need that transition IEP to target those areas that are maybe not academic, but are essential for success in post-secondary education. And the Center for Secondary Education for Students with ASD identified these three overarching areas that need to be targeted for transition success. So we would hope to see goals within the IEP that would address these problems and central coherence and executive functioning, emphasize um, our, our organization and planning sequences. And so take a look at the IEPs that are coming out for students with ASD in your schools and see how many of these kinds of skills you're actually seeing addressed in the goals. Um, ninth recommendation is that it's great to have goals, but you also have evidence-based practices to implement these kinds of interventions in these non-academic areas. So we want to see the evidence-based practices linked to the instruction. And fortunately, evidence-based practices for ASD is like one of the best researched areas for all students with disabilities. And um, there are 27 that have been identified as effective for instructing students with ASD. Seven of those are demonstrated across three or more of the domains that you're seeing here. So uh, we have a lot of resources at the end of the presentation. If you want more information on that, NTAC is another great resource to learn about linkages to critical skill development areas for ASD. And if we do that, we will wind up having students who are better prepared to um, self-advocate, disclose their disability, um, talk about the accommodations, and deal with the, strat the strategies that are needed to take a semester long course with one big paper that is 70% of your grade and break it down into manageable bites so that the students can, um, can actually do it well and, and get a good grade and not be depressed and overwhelmed and the night before the papers do realize, oh my gosh, I've only gotten one paragraph written. And because most of the students are going to attend local two-year colleges and tech colleges, we need to build bridges with the post-secondary institutions. So we want to work with them to get specific information about what majors or certificate programs are available at their college, what kind of supports there are for people with ASD, and a path to go to that support that we can direct the family and the student to before they graduate. Um, we can try to identify a point of contact at the college that would be best suited to work with Hispanic and Latino parents. Most of the um, post-secondary institutions have staff in their student disabilities resource centers who are um, Spanish speakers. Certainly there are students who are Spanish speakers that can help answer questions in the primary language for the families. We also see that uh, involving the families in post-secondary, which is not your job, obviously, you're talking with the post-secondary institutions, but because of the level of support that they're providing, having that more open communication with families, you know, getting releases for FERPA to sign off so that um, the disability centers can really talk directly with the family can really also help to um, keep an eye on the stress and the depression and the other kinds of struggles that students may face. And so it's important to kind of talk about all the range of things that are available at the post-secondary institutions that are nearby, not to say that other students won't go away, but we do know that the vast majority of them will stay within that local region. And we also know we have existing resources that we can leverage. We have Project 10, they have, the website is just chock full of things. When we had our focus groups, we at the end of them handed out the Project 10 roadmaps um, in Spanish to the families and their eyes lit up and they were like, it was like they found a hundred dollar bill in their pocket. They were like, oh, this is the greatest thing. Why, why, why did I not get this? 
So we need to use those things, get them into their hands, um, you know, take them to navigate to the website and click on the link or download it ourselves for them. CARD is available for free to any school district. Um, linking parents up to CARD can also provide advantages because most of the CARD centers now do have Hispanic staff and they are able to communicate in Spanish. And we do offer a lot of different programs that are for young adults, teenagers, and so on to help them to build these core skills because we know how difficult it is for them to be successful if they don't develop them. And then, you know, leveraging other resources that can help. So we have the BEES transition page, you have the BEES PD portal, um, you have vocational rehabilitation, another great resource, get them to the table early so that they can talk about the career camps, they can talk about the self-advocacy programming that they have and get the students involved in those things so that they're not just starting when they're 17, 18 years old, they're getting that uh, participation and, and self-determination from much younger. Um, there's also local autism support groups. There's the Autism Society of Florida that offers peers training and other social skills um, training that may be available. And really we've seen this year with COVID and the fact that everything's been online, the Hispanic community of, of parents of children with ASD has really gelled together. They're going to things across the state together. They're sharing resources. And I think that's going to hopefully continue after the end of COVID and we go back to some more face-to-face -face type things because it's really been synergistic and helped to develop some capacity in areas where there really wasn't a lot of resource so that families can take advantage of things even if they're from a rural area if they have the internet. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, becoming a VR vendor for employment services or pre-employment transition services within the school system uh, is another way to leverage both funding and materials that are uh, helpful in, in delivering these kinds of services. Um, another thing that I would say is that getting students involved in extracurricular activities is highly linked to success in post-secondary. I think something like 68% of students who completed a uh, two-year college who were uh, with ASD had participated in something during high school that was an extracurricular. And the extracurriculars give them time to practice the social skills, practice planning, take a leadership role, make decisions, all of these things that they will need to do for the rest of their life. But if they're not doing that because they're so focused on their work, that could actually hurt them. So you may need as professionals to kind of direct them there because research also shows that they don't go to club rush, they don't listen. Well, it's not that they don't listen, but they're not incentivized to join a club by morning announcements. They need that um, faculty staff member to try to integrate them into the club. And in some cases to develop the club, if there's not a club and you have you know, four students on the spectrum that are interested in anime, maybe a club, you know, make a club, it's possible. So that's another way that we can um, support them. And so what are we doing? We are working on this grant on a website and uh, posting training webinars and resources there for educators. And we're also preparing some brief YouTube videos for different stakeholder groups. And you can kind of see one of them down there is the TIEP meeting. It's animated, it's almost done, and we're really excited about it. Um, we have this infographic, Stop and Think. It's a mnemonic for things to include in the transition IEP. And the little video kind of goes along with that. So that's both for our secondary staffing spe specialists, ESE teachers, and others who are involved in the TIEP process, but also designed for the family and the student because they need to know too what is going to be required in order to be successful in that transition. Um, we also have this seminar summarized in a one-page handout there. We've got some strategies for minimizing meltdowns and supporting post-secondary students. Those are primarily aimed at the um, post-secondary faculty, but might also be useful for um, the secondary schools. And we have a 
uh, handout for Hispanic students on the benefits of preparing for post-secondary education. So that's kind of some of the resources that we are putting together, which we hope that you'll use and share with other people. And of course, CARD is also available to support uh, any evidence-based practices or training on strategies, how to teach the skills that are needed to be successful in post-secondary education. But we're not the only um, show in town. There are a lot of online resources if you need more training in ASD. And even if you need more training in best practice and transitions, we have a lot of great resources there. So um, these are some of them and you can look at them in the handouts. And I did it, Canon 9-11. So I want to thank you all for- uh, Way to go, Terry. Fast <laughs> <laughs> talk through this. I, I have a couple minutes for questions. Um, and so you have one from Sandy. Okay. Um, Sandy asks, do you find digital and internet access a barrier to these families? Not really, because I'll tell you what, um, they, it may be like, you know, Wi-Fi is not as accessible, but almost all of them have access to a cell phone in the family with some kind of data plan. So we have not found that to be a big barrier. Now, of course, you know, I'm working out of Central Florida, so our most rural area is Yeehaw Junction in Sumter County. So um, it may be a lot worse in the panhandle, but I'm, I'm not sure what other people are finding. But we haven't found, um, you know, even in COVID that we're getting people from all over joining in. Okay, I think we might have time for one or two more questions if you want to type them in the chat room. Uh, actually, Franklin reminded me that we want to oh, have time to do the poll. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Daly, for uh, providing some great information. I've been working uh, partly with Terry on this project um, just as um, a representative of the school system. And it's really a, a unique opportunity to find out a lot about what the needs of our students are. So if you're uh, um, a district person, definitely check out the resources. They're awesome. Thanks. And if you can take this little poll, it will help me show the FBDC that hopefully you learned something about the, um, the questions that were covered in the presentation. So if you have a moment, go ahead and do that. And then, you know, I can answer any other questions. I know it was really, really fast. I don't usually do 45 minutes. Terry is also really good about getting back to people. If you email her, she can uh, answer your questions and get back to you on that. Yeah. But check, definitely check out the website that'll have uh, those resources. All those resources will be there soon. Right. And right now the handouts, I uploaded all of them to this presentation. So all the ones that are done and approved by FDC, DDC are up there for you to download or share. And I can also get you, I can get you big stacks of hard copies of the ones for the students in Spanish and English. So email me if you'd like a stack for your school. That's great. So those of you that uh, don't know FDDC.org, Florida Developmental Disabilities Council is a, also a wonderful resource for getting um, information. Well, I hope it was helpful. I hope you can take things back to your schools and share them and try to move the needle a little bit for these students. So, and thank you to Franklin and, and Cannon for all the help and getting me set up too. All right. Well, I don't see any more um, questions, Terry. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day.